Okay, I really like this section of the course, uh, in part because René Descartes was one of the smartest guys in history. He invented the Cartesian coordinates, which made uh, Cartesian geometry uh, calculus possible, or at least understandable. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, but on the other hand, Really smart people can go wrong in very interesting ways. I and mean, that's what I like about Descartes, is that he has an argument that, to me, at the same time, is both brilliant and insane. So, in terms of critical reading, I'd like you to be following along. I'd like you to have been reading the book. You know, I've been telling you to read the book with a little critical eye. So when you come across an argument in the text that doesn't make sense to you, well, okay, maybe it's because you don't understand it. That can happen. But also, maybe it's because the argument just doesn't make sense. And, I'm, I mean, sometimes I will look at arguments given in textbooks or given in political philosophy or political science or, or politics and I'll go to myself, how on earth is it that anybody takes this argument seriously? How can somebody look at this way of um, thinking and accept it? This is just bananas. Why is anyone paying attention? So, Descartes' philosophy is a mixture of utter brilliance and complete nonsense. I want to try and uh, distinguish that. So, what I'm going to yes. Wait, so was it supposed to make sense to us? Uh, anyway, you read Descartes' arguments, or you read up what I say, or what Inarel says, and if it doesn't make sense, if it seems to you to be goofy, or you can't see how someone can take this thing and draw this conclusion, and sometimes it's because you're not understanding. That happens to me. Team B was a group of people who took the CIA reports that showed that the Soviet Union was in a state of near collapse, that the Soviet military was barely keeping up uh, with ours and had huge gaps, and decided on the basis of no evidence whatsoever that the Soviet Union was really extremely strong and on the verge of attacking the United States. Uh, I'll give you an example of their reasoning. There was no evidence that the Soviets had any acoustic means of detecting American submarines. In fact, there's no evidence that the Soviets had any means of finding American submarines. The normal method of doing so is acoustic, and Team B reasoned that since there was no evidence of an acoustic system, the Soviets must have some other system that is not acoustic and which gives no evidence of its existence. So there's no evidence that something's there, therefore it's there. That's like saying, there's a dragon in the room. How do we know this? Because you can't see it. It's a special dragon you can't see. Or I have a monkey climbing up the back of my head. How do I know this? But does anyone here see a monkey? No, that proves it there. It's there. So this was called logic. You can take anything and call it logic. That doesn't mean it's logic. Uh, 
Uh, did some interesting things. So, yes. Did they have reason to believe? Like, did they have a reason why they saw our summary? They had no reason whatsoever. If you look over no. their documents, they just make, they're just making stuff up. So they weren't killing our submarines or something? No. Our submarines were fine. The CIA said the Soviets can't find our submarines. We have this evidence. Yeah, Team B just went ahead and made stuff up. <laughs> well, actually, Team B's reasoning was the Soviet military manual said their air defenses were perfect. Therefore, because the Soviets tell their own people their air defenses are perfect, they must be perfect. And all this evidence the CIA found must be some elaborate plan to receive us. Um, nothing Team B ever said ever turned out to be right. It was all false. Okay. So does this mean there's no evil genius? Let me lay it out as it goes. Now, let me start at the beginning and work through. Let me do my preparatory stuff and get it. So the first thing, the first thing, well, all right, here's a little bit of background. Descartes did not set out to be a philosopher. He set out to be an astronomer. And, okay, well, one of the things I really like about this section, one of the things that's a theme in this course is looking into uh, the medieval mind. That is, looking in the way people used to think way back when. Now, you may have heard the name Galileo. said, Earth is not the center of the universe. This annoyed the church. The church wanted the Earth to be the center of the universe because if the Earth is the center of the universe, it proves that the universe was created for us. And therefore, it proves that God exists and we should follow his plan, which generally involves giving the church large amounts of money. So the response to stuff like this We're stuck in a windowless room in, um, in a community college listening to a philosophy lecture. We're really in Hawaii. Now, uh, or the Soviet Union really is a threat. The medieval mind does not like evidence. The medieval mind is not responsive to evidence. Now, 
Well, I, I should take that back. That's, that's a little harsh. Because the medieval mind is also not responsive to the prospect of being burned at the stake. There was this thing called saving the appearances. What this meant was, you could have your theory of the universe. The church could have its theory of the universe in which Earth was the absolute center, and the center of the Earth, the navel of the world, was the Garden of Eden. And this proved, this proved the existence of God and the primacy of the Christian church, and so on. And Scientists could go out and do their work and come up with uh, heliocentric models of the solar system in which the sun is in the middle, the earth is here, the moon goes round the earth, and so on. Scientists could come up with that and they would say, well, you know, if we look at it this way, if we pretend it's like this, all the observations and the calculations come out right and science is easy to do. But we know, we know it's really like this. Here's Earth in the center of the universe. Here's the sun. Here's the moon. So the reality of our situation in this room is we are actually enjoying ourselves in Hawaii. Just feel the sand under your feet and look at that beautiful blue sky and the, and the parasailers and the, and the waiters and waitresses bringing us roast something with pig, peach, orange. Um, or it can't though, because it doesn't look like that. It looks like we're in a classroom. So, for the medieval way of thinking, this was at least taken seriously. People said it, people repeated it to each other, and as, as far as I can tell, at least some people believed it. This is a way of looking at the world. It's a way the modern scientific mind uh, rejects. But it's, all, it's also a way of looking at the world that is still very common. How things look is not the way they are. Something can be true, even though there is absolutely no evidence for it, and tons and tons and tons of evidence against it. The medieval mind the idea of believing against evidence was intellectually respectable. Nowadays, it's not. If you admit that you're believing against evidence, then you admit you're not being rational. Um, so, I'm not saying that there are no medievals walking around now. There are plenty of people walking around now who um, believe against evidence, but um, that very, very few of them are taken seriously academically. Now, Descartes, Descartes had a problem. He wanted to write a book of astronomy that followed the heliocentric model, that is, put the sun in the middle. Uh, the trouble is the church wanted a geocentric model that puts the earth in the middle. Descartes did not want to get in trouble with the church. So he said, he reasoned that if, in, that if, he, if he laid in some groundwork beforehand, everything would be okay. 
he set out to convince the church that it was okay for him to do a heliocentric model of astronomy. It's okay for him to defend the heliocentric model. Because he set out to prove that reason and faith were not incompatible. He wanted to show that philosophy and religion were compatible with each other. Philosophy does not contradict religion. project. Imagine this, that we have someone who's a biologist and he wants to write uh, he wants to write a book that based on the Darwinian theory of evolution through natural selection but he doesn't want to annoy evangelical Christians. So he decides he's going to show that science and Christianity don't conflict and so he's going to do going to reinvent science from the bottom up. This is what Descartes set out to do. He set out to reinvent philosophy, to start philosophy from ground zero. Um, part of the reason for this was he looked around at philosophy. He looked around at science and uh, literature and everything that was called knowledge and found that it was all um, pretty weak that there wasn't any solidity to it. There was a lot of stuff that was believed that wasn't justified. A lot of stuff, a lot of stuff contradicted other stuff and nobody seemed to have any idea of how to settle it. It was all crap. So, Picard wanted a foreign, wanted a firm foundation for philosophy. taken it for granted that what they believed was certain, or they had um, been comfortable with uncertainty, or just hadn't thought about it. Descartes was the first person to think about this, and that's one of the things Descartes, one of the reasons Descartes is important philosophically, is he was the first guy to tackle the issue of whether or not knowledge can be certain. <coughs> Where how is certainty related to knowledge? I, I, I want to point out um, just as there's a distinction between logic and logic, there's a distinction between certainty and certainty. 
Have you ever met someone who is absolutely certain about something you knew to be false? Absolutely certain about the outcome of, a, um, of an upcoming baseball game? Or absolutely certain about something that happened to other people? And they don't have any evidence, and you have evidence that contradicts them, but it doesn't matter to them because they just feel it could not possibly be wrong. Well, Descartes is not interested. Descartes is not interested in anybody's emotions. He's not interested in his own emotions. He wants logical, logical certainty. He wants things that really can't be true, not things that it would hurt very much if they turned out not to be true. You guys see the difference? So. I won't accept it. Now, this is very different from something like criteria of reasonable doubt. In a, in a criminal trial, if there is a reasonable doubt uh, of the defendant's guilt, they're considered innocent. But it's not all possible doubt. It's not logical doubt. You can imagine someone. You imagine someone uh, on trial for murder, and the defense asks, "Can the prosecution prove that it wasn't done by Martians using robot, a robot in the set, in the shape of the defendant? Can you prove that that didn't happen?" Can you prove that that could not have happened? Well, you can prove it with sort of a, 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 to a reasonable certainty because, as far as we can tell, there are no Martians. If there were Martians, we have evidence. So you've got good reason to think there are no Martians. You've got good reason to think that no, uh, no robots like that exist. We have good reason to think that if Martians did exist and had robots like that, they wouldn't be interested in training the defendant. So the suggestion is absolutely unreasonable. It is ludicrous. But it's not logically impossible. And because it's not logically impossible, it's not certain that it's false. So this is why Descartes invents the evil genius. contradict the evidence. But is it logically impossible? No. No, it's not logically impossible. I mean, I don't 
And no one would seriously take, would take this proposition seriously for a second, except maybe a member of TV. Um, but it's not logically impossible. You know what logical impossibility is, right? How many, how many married bachelors are there in the universe? And I'm talking the whole universe, all the way out to the greater track from beyond. Uh, well, about guys are just unfaithful to their wives. No, no, married bachelors. I'm not talking about something that's not a married bachelor. A person who's married and is a bachelor, no, not not mind. married and a bachelor, but actually married and actually a bachelor. No, no. You can't have it. How many square circles in the universe? Zero, because if something's a square, it's not a circle. If it has four straight lines joined by right angles, uh, equal length, it doesn't have, it, it has corners. Squares, um, circles don't have corners. A circle is one closed curve. So if it's a square, it's not a circle. It's a circle. And we know with absolute certainty there are no square circles in the universe because it's logically impossible. But is it logically impossible? Is there a logical contradiction involved in believing that we're in Hawaii? If you believe that we're, that we're in Hawaii, you would be believing against the evidence. You would be contradicting all the evidence available to you, but you wouldn't be contradicting yourself. If you believe that a square circle exists, if you believe that someone is a married bachelor, you will be holding two beliefs that construct, contradict each other, so you will be contradicting yourself. So, imagine there's an evil genius who can fool us about everything, about earning all of our senses. We could have been on a plane, we lost the last, I don't know, 14 hours on a plane to Hawaii, um, but the evil genius is controlling our senses, so we think we were doing whatever it was we thought we were doing this weekend. Uh, let's try another one. Uh, has any of you heard of Australia? Yes. Is it logically possible that Australia is an elaborate joke um, concocted by some frat boys in Texas? No. They, they created, like in like, like say 50 years ago, they created the idea of coming up with an imaginary country, and they got out and they put, uh, put information into libraries, faked geography textbooks, faked maps. Well, there have been some elaborate hoaxes in history. Um, there are elaborate hoaxes going on now, crop circles. Um, so it's possible to fake a lot. Ever see the movie The Matrix? Yes. Old concept in science fiction. Take control of somebody's sensory input. You can make him or her think that he's anywhere or anything. In the movie, they have this character, Neo, who finds out that where he, he's not where he thinks he is, he's at, that all that going to work every day and cracking the computers and stuff like that was all an illusion. And then they pop him out of this little cell. And the most disappointing thing here is that when he comes out of this little um, cell, he's still Keanu Reeves. There's no reason for that. He could be like a little old black woman. Like, holy crap, I'm a little old black woman. Or, or a purple jellyfish. Senses can be fooled. 
You can't trust sensory information. So, what do you found knowledge on? Dr. Carl asks, um, can you found knowledge on mathematics? You see, look, you have one and one, and if you add them together, you get three. And could you be fooled about that? So, you know, you just separate them out. Take three, take one away from three, you've got one. Well, to can't write, imagine that when I add three and five, the evil genius is messing with my mind, so it appears to come out to be eight, but it's really not. So, Carl asks us to imagine that what's really going on when we have one and one is we get this result. Any of you play online games, models, or games, uh, computer games? It'd be pretty easy to program a computer universe where the math was different. Right? You add two things together and it sends out three. <coughs> You add one and one, get three. Two and two, get five. Three and three, get seven. There'd be some way of making it consistent. Well, you don't have to. You don't have to make it consistent. So if you've got control of the uh, computer universe, you can make it come out any way you like. You know, Grand Theft Auto. Does Grand Theft Auto follow the real laws of physics? No, no, it doesn't. Uh, it'd be pretty hard to make a computer game that really follows the laws of physics. So, Descartes doesn't even trust mathematics. To me, that's weird, because I think of mathematics as a part of logic. Is mathematics part of logic, or is mathematics part of experience? If mathematics is part of experience, then sure, okay, we can't trust math. If mathematics is a matter of logic, then Descartes in trouble because all of this is supposed to be about logic. If you can't trust logic, you can't trust anything. That's why I'm always amused when someone says that something transcends logic. If something transcends logic, then it just can't exist. Because logic is how you tell whether or not things exist. And if something's not bound by logic, it can do two entirely opposing things, no problem. It can be a square circle, it can be a married action, it can be good and evil at the same time. It can torture innocent participants and be good. Because you know, all of that's logic. Alright. So now back to the Hawaii thing, back to the Australia. Has anyone heard of the Great Attractor? Anyone taken an astronomy class? Anything on her lap? See, our, our group of galaxies is whizzing through space in a certain direction. And uh, modern astronomers think that the reason for that is that there is a huge mass of galaxies in that direction that's pulling us that way through gravity. But it's so far away that light hasn't reached us yet. And I'm not sure how gravity can get here before light, but that's the, but that's the way it seems to be. So this thing is so far away, uh, we can't see it. Does anyone think, can, can anyone here reasonably doubt the existence of the Great Attractor? Well, I could be just making it up, right? Or the island of Madagascar. How many of you have heard of Madagascar? Um, is it possible that Madagascar is an imaginary island that they just put on the uh, maps as a joke? Um, well, what do, what do you know? This is the, the point is, the card's point is, you don't know anything to be true. You, you may know things like there's no married bachelors and there's no square circles. But, um, we can be fooled about what we see. 
Say again? Yes. <laughs> exactly. You've got it. Um, at this point, you don't know anything at all. Descartes' books were called Meditations on the First Philosophy. And what he's trying to do in his meditations is not simply lay out an argument, but take the reader on a sort of mental journey. Start about imagine this, imagine that, and get to this, and get to this point. So if you've got to the point where you think, hey, we don't know anything at all, or if Descartes right, we don't know anything at all. Descartes next point is, can you come up with anything that's absolutely certain? Can you come up with anything that's certain? That's something that could not be false. And Descartes did. You can doubt the existence of the Great Attraction. You can doubt the existence of Madagascar. You can doubt the existence of Texas. I mean, think about it. Texas, they have those big hats. And, you know, that's an absurd problem anyway. But how could you doubt the existence of Madagascar or you take a map and put so many miles off the coast compared to the island? I've seen fake maps. I've seen fake maps. There are people who think, there are people who believe the moon landing is fake. There are people who believe the pictures of the round Earth from space were faked. The people who believe the Earth is flat. I mean, I understand that. I mean, I, I've been prehistoric times. I mean, I'm not talking about that. There are people time. now who think the moon landing is fake. And they were looking for the post office and that kind of collection. That's not the point. So what I'm trying to say is, I mean, you're, you're trying to say you want us to think logically. Yes. Okay. I want you to think logically. So let's take a couple of those islands. Who says that those are real? Right, exactly. We have lots and lots of sensory evidence and reports of other people's sensory evidence that these things exist. Right. The car rejects sensory evidence. The senses can be fooled. And he's looking for something that's absolutely certain. Not 99.999% certain, but absolutely. So, well, then you find a problem with the logic yet. Well, you're saying you don't know anything, so you I haven't got that. I mean, there's one thing that he knows. He takes you to this point and asks you, is there anything that cannot be logically doubted? Is there any fact in the universe that can't be logically doubted? Yeah. Sorry, that's the one he comes up with, but not our. I can doubt your existence. His own existence. I doubt his. that I am doubting now. Could the evil genius be fooling you about the fact that you're doubting your own existence? If I doubt my own existence, I am doubting. So, Kant says, So something exists. Cogito ergo sum. Thinking, therefore, existence. Yes, sir. Well, couldn't he have, uh, <laughs> like, 
been able to prove that his body existed by flopping off his hand. I mean, you chop off your hand, you're not going to be able to think about anything else except for the pain. Well, then he's not going to be able to prove anything. What, how would Descartes answer that? Well, you have lots of sensations. You have this. You ever heard of phantom limbs? Yes. Right? People have lost limbs while you find them itching. Because there's a body, there's a mind structure, that is, uh, neural wiring that's devoted to something that doesn't exist anymore. And it, neurons basically get bored and start inventing information. So the mind makes stuff up. It's a mental model. <coughs> if, if you trust the senses, if you think the senses are trustworthy, then sure, you know, cutting off your hand or just hitting yourself up the side of the head, that will prove it. If your criteria of proof is to say, I will accept sensory information. But sensory information can be wrong. And as long as it's logically possible that there's an evil genius, it's possible that the evil genius is fooling us about these experiences. Have you ever had a dream in which you were hurt, or in which bad stuff happened, and you woke up and said, oh, thank God, it's only a dream? There's what's called Descartes' dream problem. Can anyone prove to himself or herself that he or she isn't dreaming now? could be a really boring, unpleasant dream. I've had boring dreams. Say? I've had annoying dreams. So, for the car, remember, if you can come up with a logically possible scenario in which that experience is reproduced, in which that experience is being faked by some kind of machinery, and the easiest way to do it is an experience tank, like the Matrix, uh, or something that makes you dream. And I have very, very, very vivid dreams. I've had very, very vivid, I had a very vivid reading experience once. I was once so into a book that when the book ended, I went, what, 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 what happened? And then I went, oh, it's not real. And I, mean, I, I was sitting, I found myself in the living, my own living room, and it was a strange place to me. How did I get here? What is this place? Because my mind had adjusted so deeply to the world of that book that when the book ran out, I thought I'd run out of reality. Yeah, Chris. Same thing when you watch a scary movie. Oh. Oh. Oh yeah. yeah. Have you ever been so into a movie where when it ends, it's like... I had a dream like that too. I woke up and found myself in Canada. Uh, so, but this says, look, if you doubt that you're doubting, if you doubt that you exist, you must exist to be doubting yourself. Or at least that doubting must exist. And I'm talking about Descartes, not. Because you must exist to have a doubt. 
can Mickey Mouse doubt his own existence? Well, no, Mickey Mouse doesn't exist. Mickey Mouse can't do anything. So if you can do something, you must exist. When I saw Mickey Mouse, I thought they took a picture with him and didn't. Hey, we need to talk. <laughs> The next thing he comes up with is lots, lots of ideas exist in my mind. Lots of ideas exist in my mind. So, um, think about elephants. Is it logically possible that your idea, your idea of an elephant doesn't exist? That, that idea that you've got in your mind right now doesn't exist? It's possible that elephants don't exist. Well, think of a dragon. Uh, Think of, I don't know, um, a UFO. Think of um, the little gray aliens. Think of lots of, you know, think, make something up. Make up some weird animal to think about. It. It's something you know doesn't exist, but is it possible that your idea of that thing doesn't exist? Once you have an idea, that idea exists as an idea. So you can you can get lots and lots of certainty about your own mental experience. So so each of you knows one existence containing a bunch of existences. Each of you knows that you exist at least as a mind. You don't know for certain that anybody else exists. But you do have certainty that you exist. Now, how does Kant avoid solipsism? Solipsism is the doctrine that only I exist. So if I'm a solipsist, I will think that you don't exist. Only I exist. You are my dream. You are, you're my nightmare. I don't know what. I'm dreaming here. Um, Descartes doesn't want to be a solipsist, but how do you avoid it? How do you get a certainty about anything outside your own head? Um, Sam, now, solipsism is hard to refuse. If your criteria, if you're a solipsist, and your criteria is you have to know stuff for certain, solipsism certainty, it would appear that solipsism can't be refuted. Now, if you mean a solipsist, what do you do? Well, you walk up, slap him upside the head, and say, there, doesn't that prove I exist? And the solipsist says, ow, what an unpleasant dream. I wish I had better control over my dreams. I wish my dreams didn't have stupid people in them, like this Jeff. Can anyone think of a way it's like, it's like solving the dream problem? Is there any kind of experience you can have in a dream, or that you could have right now that proves this isn't a dream? Is there any kind of experience? Can you dream that you're I think I did. I think I dream. I know I dreamed that I woke up. Oh, what, have you ever dreamed that you woke up and went to work, and then you find out you're still in bed? Oh, oh God, I'm gonna get it. I thought it was a oh, God damn it. So. 
So, mind exists, or the car exists as a mind. contains ideas. We know this for certain. Descartes' mind contains ideas. Now, I want to talk about the word substance. Sameness is okay. We know what sameness means. The word substance is a word that has a bizarre history. And nowadays, the word substance is taken to refer to stuff, like the stuff you might find on the bottom of your shoe, like stuff you might find just lying around. That's not what it meant when the word was coined. The word was coined to mean something very specific. And it wasn't anything you could see, hear, feel, touch, smell, or anything like that. Substance. Well, let's say you go into a, a, into a, uh, into a brand new house, fully tricked out, and there's a hardwood floor. You see all this oak on the floor, right? Or red, or whatever they use to make it. You guys know what a, a subfloor is? Yeah. Subfloor is that particle board or plywood that lies under the hardwood floor. So if you're in a house with hardwood floors, they've got a subfloor too. So it's a layer of, um, of particle board. Do you ever see the subfloor? Right. You only see the subfloor when the house is wrecked or something's being taken apart, right? You're not supposed to see the subfloor. It stands, it sits under the floor. Well, that's what substance means. Now, this is a medieval concept, or an ancient <coughs> concept. This is not a concept that modern science has. But it's a, yeah. Sorry, I hate to interrupt you, but not the, what's that mean? The third word up very top? Cochito? And the cochito, we know several things. If we get to the cochito, we know the world might exist, because it has to be this group, and we know the cartridge of the mind exists. Yeah, but what does the cochito mean? Cochito ergo sum. 
the Fujita argument, I think, uh, therefore, thinking exists, or something exists. Substance. There's a problem in philosophy. What makes things into the things they are? What makes this cup this cup? To the medievals, this was a live problem, and they solved it by coming up with the concept of substance. The cup is a substance. Can you see the substance? No. But you know it's there because we see the cup. Now think about this cup. Is the shape the cup? Is the color the cup? Is the, uh, the texture of the cup, the rigidity of the cup, the strength of the cup? Well, according to the medievals, no, because you could take it away and it would still be the thing. It could have a different shape. It could still be the cup. It could have a different color. Think of it, think of it this way. Imagine that you have a neighbor who's really into cars, and he has he buys this car, bought this car 25 years ago, and he's been working on it ever since, and he's changed everything. He even changed the chassis, changed the engine, the drive train, so, engine several times. You go out to his backyard where all the discarded pieces are, and you realize you can make two or three cars with what he's taken out of that car. And you ask him, is that the same car? And he says, sure, I bought this car 25 years ago. I've changed a few things out. And you ask, well, what parts of this car are original equipment? And he goes through it and says, well, none of it. Not one part of this car is the original part of the original car. But it's still the same car. So how do you solve that problem? How do you, what makes it the same? To the medievals, it was it had substance. It was some intangible, undetectable, non-sensible thing that stood beneath it, that made it the cup, that made it the cup, that makes me me. So, Descartes has this idea of substance, and he has the idea of the sameness. Did anyone notice this cup before I picked it up to uh, you know, use it as an example? Or did anyone see a purple cup on this desk five minutes ago? Yeah. Was it the same cup? Yeah. We believe that, don't we? I have to you have reasons to believe that, but you don't have the kind of reasons that the cup will accept. So, oh. <coughs> There it is, yes. All right. Now, Descartes finds in his own mind the idea of sameness. He finds in his own mind the idea of substance. And he asks, where did those ideas come from? Yeah. those ideas come from? Now, the modern answer, the modern answer, at least the sameness, is um, but, you know, how do we know it's the same? But I saw it there before. I have the same sensory impressions, right? You have the same sensory impressions you're having now. If I had the same sensory impressions back then, this must be the same thing. So the same sense data, same object. Descartes says this is wrong. 
Kant says same sense data does not mean same object. Same object does not mean same sense data. To the modern mind, saying it's the same object pretty much is like saying it's the same sense data. That's not the God's answer. God thinks that, that is a weak answer. God thinks that we cannot get the idea of sameness from the external world. We cannot get the idea of substance from the external world. It has to come from somewhere else. Now, Descartes uses for the example of the rats. Honeycomb. Get a piece of honeycomb, and when you get it, and it's, uh, it will smell of honey, it will smell of bees, taste liquid or taste of honey, it smells of bees, uh, it's, it's hard, uh, it has a definite shape, it has all kinds of properties, all kinds of sensory data that are identified as this, this piece of honeycomb. And you take this piece of honeycomb, and Descartes gives the example of the walk across to fire. And as you take uh, as you take the honeycomb from the cold part of the room to the hot part of the room, <coughs> certain things happen. The smell goes away. The taste goes away. The hardness goes away. It becomes soft. It starts to lose its shape. It starts to lose its color. It starts to lose its cohesion. And eventually, you have a puddle of hot liquid. Put down by the fire, you've got a puddle of liquid. Now, the car asks, what makes this the same as this? What makes these, the, the wax at the start of the process, the same thing as this puddle of liquid at the, the, the end of the process? And his answer is, well, it's the same substance. How do we know it's the same substance? How do we know substance exists at all? Descartes says it's innate. And the reason it has to be innate is because it's not gone from the senses. Substance is saying this on a sense base, so they're innate. Why aren't they sense based? Well, Descartes says, Descartes invites you to tell him what sensory experience is shared between these two objects. We know they're the same. Um, we know there's something that makes them the same. But can, what is that? something that you get from the senses. If it's substance, 
You can't. It can't be gone from the senses. Substance can't be gone from the senses. Because substance is not anything you sense. The substance of this cup is what stands below it metaphysically and makes it real. I'm so glad that wasn't my fault. Um, substance is what stands below this metaphysically and makes it real, makes it exist. But you don't sense substance. According to, the, according to their argument, it has to be there for the cup to exist, for the cup to remain the cup. And it's not sensory. If it was sensory, according to the card, if it was sensory, there would be something that I could point out to here and say, look, this has this property. It, it's hard, and this is something, but that's not hard. It's yellow, but well, that's not yellow. It's not yellow anymore. Um, it's got, it's hexagonal, it's got hexagonal, but it doesn't. Descartes' wax example, his argument of the wax, is that I can take a physical object and I can change it so it has no sensory properties that remain the same in the process. I can take it from something that has a whole bunch of sensory properties here and get rid of all of them over here, and yet it's the same thing. How can that work? How can these two things be the same? Now, Descartes' answer is that it's because of the substance. They're the same because they have the same substance. Now, but I don't get that from my senses. It's not a sense-based idea. So Descartes thinks he's proved that there is an idea in our heads, in his head, that could not come from outside. It has to be innate. The idea of substance has to be an innate idea. It was built into his head from the very beginning. Now, the existence of innate ideas is an important part of Descartes' argument. So, between now and Wednesday, I want you to think about how well this argument works. Do you see a mistake with the class made? Where does he go with it?